Victoria. Yeah. Yeah. So welcome to the panel. This is uh, from gaming enthusiast to gaming PR, uh, starring J.S. Spadeo. I'm not anybody important, but if anyone cares, my name's Adam. <laughs> uh, so the two of us actually work at Ubisoft together. Uh, Jason is our public relations manager. Uh, I'm one of his co-workers. I handle retail marketing, but that has nothing to do with why we're here today. We are here to really discuss Jay, uh, understand his transformation uh, from going to just a gaming enthusiast in a game like everybody in this room, and actually making it to working in one of the third-party companies and experiencing the video game industry from the other side of the coin. So uh, we're going to start off talking a little bit about Jay himself. We'll let you, I'll let him explain basically what he's doing now, what he did before, how he got to where he is today, and uh, then we'll open it up for some questions afterwards. So uh, feel free to think of some good ones. So uh, let's kick it off, Jay. So, yeah, yeah, so awesome. let, tell us a bit about yourself. Like, uh, how, what were you, where did you start off? With? Where did you start? Off? Where um, did you start off? With? Well, I was a gamer. I was still a gamer, and I think I'll be a gamer forever, just like everybody else here. Uh, basically, my road was I was gaming started just as a normal gamer, uh, and then I started branching out more into sports. So my ideal of gaming was always a hobby; it will always be a hobby. And basically, uh, when my basketball career didn't work out so well, I started developing much more the coaching aspect and working with public, basically. Uh, it helped out in order to uh, help me forget uh, my failure as a basketball player and then finding out that speaking with people and being much more approachable in terms of public and being around more people and talking about something that I like uh, through coaching, I ended up liking it very much. Um, but gaming never really was something like I want to do a career out of it, you know, it was never in my plans. Um, that is when I started blogging, basically. So we're talking in 2005, you know. I started blogging, just posting online. Um, and then basically a friend of mine who had a website said, hey, you wanna work, you wanna write it for us and you know, get involved into a community. At the point, uh, there was no Xbox Live party chats or whatnot, so you know, basically the forums were the place to be. Um, so we started working in there, you know, handling communities and after a couple of years, I was decided to, I was like, okay, you know, this blogging thing might be interesting, let's push a little bit more further. So now I was kind of handling a website um, named uh, Game Focus. So at the time it was just French based, um, and then we branched out into English. And this guy was given the responsibility to create a community in English. There was many out there, you know, from Toronto, the West Coast and everything, but there was nothing that came out of uh, our small community in Quebec. So I, was, I started branching out, getting on some folks that were in different blogging spheres, different sites, and then we started having fun, you know, like reviewing games and talking about games, doing podcasts, uh, going to events and stuff, going to conventions as well. And then at one point, uh, a friend of mine said, hey, you know, have you ever thought of maybe working in the industry? And I was like, no, hell no, I'll never do that. You know, I'll just branch out into gaming, have a little blog and have my little fun. And then up until two years ago, the blogging, as you know, has exploded with the internet and stuff. The game has become much more popular and then more people are, have access, knowledge, they want to talk about game more and more and more and more. And at one point I just said, there's a lot of people out there, you know, and for me in order to make it out, I have to keep going and pushing. So it was more, the blogging became management, management became 24 hour basically job, you know, two phones, laptop, working night shifts, convenience stores and stuff like that with the coaching schools at the same time. So the passion really took over everything because I ended up quitting basketball, I ended up quitting coaching basketball and, and it became really, really not only a hobby but something that I wanted to do further. And working three years basically, blogging constantly all the time, managing teams, I was exhausted, basically. Um, you know, I'm 32 years old, I just turned 32, and um, that was two years ago, and I was like, you know what, I'm thinking that maybe I may not do the blogging anymore. And it was hard for me to realize it, to say, well, I have to go back to the hobby thing and just play games and write just for fun, but, you know, basically, there's no chance for me to actually doing anything. And then I went to E3 last year for the last time, and then I spoke with people and said, you know, after E3, I may just give up, you know, I'll keep on just blogging for fun, but 
the management side of things and you know building a community and doing articles practically every single day it was just too tiresome so i had to make a choice and then it's when i uh, went to e3 and i had dinner with one of my good friends that works in the industry and we had the discussion and he said well what about working in the industry you know there's might be somebody out there that might like to hire you or give you any you know a life learning experience and i was like i don't know you know what's that gonna do you know i can give a shot and um, I remember basically just saying, as August 1st last year, and saying, you know, I'm no longer writing anymore. I will just get a job normally and just game in my spare time and, you know, go to other things. And then basically what happened afterwards, I wrote the email and then I sent it out to my contacts and the industry and friends saying, hey, I'm quitting. Uh, thank you for the memories. Thank you for everything. I was doing that for Bethany, you know, a long time already, like six years. And then at one point, email started to pour in, and people were like, maybe you'd like to work a job with an other company, you know? Would you like a job? Would you like a job? Like, I don't like, this is really happening. Like, I didn't believe it. Up until Ubisoft uh, showed up, and uh, they were basically saying, you know, we're looking for a PR, we're looking for a person that knows gaming, inside out, uh, what do you say? And at first, I, I was kind of, intimidated, scared. I was like, well, Ubisoft, it's kind of a big step, you know, usually when somebody enters the industry, they start, you know, mobile, you know, small studios, independent, and then they work their way up, usually. So, to get to Ubisoft and actually, say, get into interviews and basically say, you start Monday, it was like, I couldn't believe it. So, you know, I've been in the office already for a year, and I'm still learning the other side, but I, I feel like I'm privileged to be part of the industry and sending this message as well to people and this is what this panel is about and how I was approached to do the panel is to basically share my experience and say that anybody out there, you know, I know that there's countless blogs and sites and, you know, radio stations, podcasts, TV, you name it, that want to make it into the industry and just want to be respected, basically. And, uh, you know, I see it every day at Fan Expo, you know, since the show started, people coming in with their blogs and, you know, doing their thing, say, hey, you know, I want to, I would like to bring it out, what should I do? And they'll say, well, first come to my panel. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, I was just basically just giving them drinks. I was like, dude, I, I used to be there before I did this, you know. If it's that what you want to do, then it's totally feasible because I just made it. You know, I wanted one of those lucky ones that, you know, through hard work, for sure. Um, you know, I think in the last three years before Ubisoft, I think I slept four hours a day because I was constantly blogging, preparing, managing, writing, previewing, reviewing podcasts, you know, covering events at the same time, you know, I know that some guys here in the room, you know, they were like, how do you do it? It's 3 a.m. and you're posting articles, you're not supposed to be sleeping. Like, yeah, I slept an hour ago, I'm good, I'm fine, <laughs> you know? Um, it's, it's an industry that it's really tough to get in, but if you got this drive, then nothing can stop you. So, thanks for sharing. One of the issues we actually covered in this morning's panel, which was a little bit different, was how people react uh, to individuals in the gaming industry. I mean, right now, video games are bigger than movies, and just by a show of hands, we can see the audience. Has there anyone here who considered a career in video games, whether it be design, the business end? Yeah, I figured as much a good portion. So, one of the challenges I know I faced before I got into it was that people didn't receive it well. It was kind of like, you're dreaming, you're never going to get in, it's impossible to get in, you're nobody special. Forget it, go be an accountant. What, what, kind, of what kind of challenges did you have? Did, was it was well received when you turned your hobby and passion into a career? It was well received. Obviously, in my case, when you're crazy as I am, you alienate yourself from practically anyone that you know that is close to you, right? So. You know, like these, like I have two phones. I work with two phones. So, you know, when I'm in bed and it's 10.30 and an email shows up, you know, all this brand new news, something happened in Japan and you know, we have to cover it, you know. So I will just plug in my laptop and start working up until 3 a.m. So, obviously there's people, family, you know, they're like, oh, why do you do it? You know, it's not, it doesn't pay and you're not going to get nothing out of this, you're getting exploited, blah, blah, blah. So, I think, for anything that you do, whether it's gaming or anything else, you know, movies or any other type of entertainment, sports, you know, passion is something that cannot be taught. Either you have it or, or you don't. And people sometimes don't understand what passion really means. And 
for me, it's something that, you know, as an ex-athlete and stuff, you know, passion is something that drives me, like, every day. And uh, I think the biggest challenge just was to make, understand, like, those close to me. You know, why do you spend 12 hours in front of your laptop and you're not getting a paycheck? You know, why do you do it? I don't understand. Like, my father was, you know, simply just static. He's like, why do you do this? For, like, four years, he was counting just said, this is not going to get you anywhere. You should get a job, like, you know, anywhere else. And why do you do it for free? And, you know, oh, you go to Toronto. Oh, great. You have to pay for it. Yeah? Why? You know, like, it's, it's just this dedication. You know, it, people will not understand it. You know, people will constantly challenge you. And the industry, whatever you're working, whether it's in the gaming industry, you know, of course, you always get that challenge. You always going to be get a challenge. And for PR, for me, you know, the, the, the biggest challenge is the fact that we're out there. You know, if you Google my name in Ubisoft, you'll, you'll find my contacts. You know, you know how to reach me. We're reachable 24 hours, seven days, like practically anywhere. I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Pinterest, like I'm everywhere. So our challenge for us is more about knowing who's really doing it for the right reasons and who you, you can tell passion. When the guy comes up or the girl comes up, start talking, you can tell already, okay, this person wants to make a difference. You know, this blog wants to make a difference, this side wants to make a difference. And it cannot be undermined, you know. I, I'm I, I guess because I'm coming from that background that I'm more understanding than others, maybe, I don't know, but the feedback that I get so far is that, you know, people understand it. You know, I treat the same people the same way people treated me when I started, and I think it's just pay it forward. What do you think some of the challenges were starting at Ubisoft, coming from a, a gaming site that was Canadian and originally French, going into a multinational corporation that is Ubisoft? How did you feel when you started with that? I was scared. It's hard, you know? People expect a lot from you all of a sudden, you know? Ubisoft, oh wow. As a fan, for me, I mean, I'm a gamer and I grew up playing, you know, Ghost Recons and Splinter Cell and Rainbow Six, Assassin's Creed. So, to work with Ubisoft is like, okay, how am I gonna deal with this now? Because, it, well, I'm talking about my favorite franchises and then you'll say, yeah, you work for Ubisoft, you know? So it's hard to just explain that conversation. I don't know, but you don't understand, like, I played this game before I actually was at Ubisoft, and I like this. So if any of you guys end up working at Blizzard, you know, and then it's like, oh, my favorite game is StarCraft. <coughs> I'm going to try to dissect that and try to explain it. No, 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 no. I, I liked StarCraft before. And it's, I'm not just repping something. It's, so I think the biggest challenge is to just dissociate your appreciation from what you like and the job that you're actually doing. I mean, I'm constantly on Twitter, sometimes I'm like, oh, I just played Lollipop Chainsaw, it was awesome. And then I'll just get a message saying, why is the UBI talking about Wonder Game? It doesn't matter, you know? I'm repping the game, but that doesn't stop me from playing other games. So, I think that's the biggest challenge, separating your passion from what you're actually doing right now. What would you tell these guys here if they were legitimately trying to get into the industry? What advice would you give them? motivate them so that even if their surrounding family, friends, or whatever aren't necessarily supportive of a sale will never happen, what kind of words of encouragement could you offer? Be yourself. Don't try to oversell yourself. And if you really think that you're making a difference, ride on it and keep going because that is what's going to get the respect. You know? I still remember when I sent that email saying that I was moving away from game focus and basically I wasn't even thinking about going to Ubisoft. Like, Ubisoft is not even in the plan at that point. And people were like, oh, so you're going to work in the industry, are you? I'm like, no, I'm just quitting. <laughs> like, I'm literally quitting. There's no way I'm going into this. I'm done. August 1st, deal, done. And afterwards, when people were starting sending those emails, all these marketing directors, PRs, developers, creative directors, presidents that who were you know, in touch of all these years, I was like, I don't understand. Like, you're really moving forward? Like, you're not going to work in the industry? And I was like, well, as of today, no. And I was just looking at these emails just coming in the next couple hours and I was literally just crying. It was like, these people really believe that I could make it. And it was flattering. And then it's when two weeks later that everything started rolling and I just couldn't believe it. I mean, hey, we're glad to have you with the company. Hey. <laughs> Maybe what we'll do is, uh, I'm sure there's a lot of questions whether you about Jay personally in the industry. And I mean, obviously he has a wealth of experience. So what we'll do is we'll open up the floor. We want to hear some really great questions from you guys. I'm sure there's tons on your mind. Feel free to send anything forward. There's no such thing as a stupid question, so please don't feel shy. So 
Let's get rolling. Let's go. Uh, currently, I've just started up like a small time YouTube channel, uh, Facebook, Twitter, kind of stuff. What kind of stuff could I do to kind of give it a bit more professional feel? Like, it would be a web page or a Reddit or? It doesn't. It doesn't. I, in my opinion, I, mean, I, I I deal a lot with blogs and sites and a lot of broadcasts and stuff, but. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, there was this um, gentleman who came up to me and said, I want to do YouTube. And I was like, okay, you want to do YouTube? That was the email. You know, I'd like to work with you, I want to do YouTube. That was it. <laughs> so I was like, all right, well, thank you, sir. I started replying, and I was like, well, what is it? Talk to me about YouTube. I went to see, I saw his stats, you know, he had like 2 million views and you know, 2,000, I think it was 3,000 followers and stuff. But I already did my research, but I want him to talk to me. It's like, well, what do you do? What is it about it? I already did my research by telling me about it, what you do. And the guy was telling me that, you know, he was doing a multi-language support in Canada. So it wasn't only French and English, but he was doing Spanish, Portuguese as well and everything. So he was, was like, well, sir, if you're just doing YouTube, that's fine. You have an audience already, apparently. People are appreciating what you're doing. You know, in, in the post production and the green screen, you can tell if he had like a green screen going on and he was playing like trailers behind him, was talking. It was insane. And that was already for me. It was like, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do that because I wasn't into video and stuff, but I couldn't do it. And I respected that. I was like, sir, here's my email, here's my contact, let me know what you need. And the guy was like, great, awesome. Well, wow. I, he didn't even know what he wanted to ask at first, afterwards. So I was like, would you like to do, you know, Babel Rising? And it's like, okay. And that was it. And two days later, I got a video review. Well done, well Babel Rising. So that just proves me that the guy is very dedicated. And even if it was YouTube, like very niche. We all know that YouTube is a very niche but very popular, you know, uh, way of communication. So at that point, I'm like, this guy can do this in two days? I cannot even imagine what he could do if I actually worked with him for a month. So, if you have a YouTube channel and people have a hard time believing in your YouTube channel, I suggest keep doing it and leave your business card before you go. Gentlemen, over here had a question. Uh, how did you differentiate your blogs and everything from others to get yourself? Like you said, everybody really was so upset that you were quitting. Like, how did you kind of? Get that big of a following, that dedicated I think, following. I think today, um, what we see, and what I see a lot, is that a lot of sites and blogs, they all cover the same stuff. Because it's accessible, right? A press release, a new trailer that release, so on and so forth. It's great, but what's gonna make you come out of the bunch is your original content. What you are able to create. What, what insight you can bring to your readership. You know, are you treating the game differently? Are you having, you know, I don't know, are you in costume when you do it? I don't know, you know? Uh, it, I think it's not necessarily what you're trying to convey, but how you're trying to convey it, because that is how you get the respect and the viewership as well, and the readership at the same time. So it's not only taking any information that everybody gets, but what you're gonna do with that information. Because one guy can just press, and I've seen this actually, and it's very unfortunate, you know, I take a week to write a press release, and when I get it out, it takes 30 seconds and the press release is pasted on the website. That breaks my heart. You know, that's just information dumping, right? But if you take that press release, you cut it out, you put some commentary, a few screenshots in the trailer, then it's like, he took the time of reading it and doing it. Good job to you. So simple things like that, you know? And I know so many PRs, and I made friends across all these classes as well, and we all agree on that. I think it's the effort. The effort that you want to put, the time that you're willing to put into it. That's going to kind of make you more successful. Yes, uh, working in PR, there will often be like kind of, is there like PR nightmares, like something you didn't expect would come up as some kind of controversy? How hard is it to try a, to try and stay on top of those or nip them in the butt before they become anything big? You know, there's a big misconception about PR that they're the biggest liars. And I think the best PR that you can get is the most honest answer. And people actually react well to it, most of them. Some of them are like, you're just telling me that to make you shut up. And I'm like, no, I'm, seriously, you know, when this guy asked for used game sales, I'm like, I'm just not gonna comment on it because we can go on and on and on. But it's true, we can really go on and on and on. It's not because I don't wanna talk about it. Um, but for your question, I mean, usually what we do is like, we try to track as much that we can and 
not only try to contain the problem because when it's a problem, it's a problem, we need to face it. We don't want to hide it. And in today's world, when someone says something, it's really hard to just hide it forever. Big example, uh, Alex Hutchinson, a good friend of mine, uh, he was at Gamescom last week, and he did a comment about um, how some North American games are getting bashed because they're repetitive and stuff. But if there's a new Mario game, you know, Jack in Japan gets like a pass. Which was a common, very personal and stuff, but he used the word racism. Yeah, that's a nightmare for us. It's like, no, he said right, racism, and it's not. And he, he, made, he said it, but he didn't really want it to mean like racism between like North American people and, and Asian people. But some people took out of context, and this is where our job comes in. So when we see our contacts, we re reusing that news and retool it, then I have to like email the guy and say, yeah, uh, you wrote this, and he didn't he didn't mean it that way. Like you're twisting his words. So our job for us is just to track everything that happens and try not to eliminate the problem, but educate the person and say that's not what he said. Now, what you want to retract your comment or not, that's completely up to you. But this is what he would meant to say. But we went to Alex and said, you shouldn't say racism. <laughs> so. Apparently. Yes, sir. How do you deal with belligerent people? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I assume you get a lot of them. We, we do. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I actually have two folders in my inbox. One is hilarious and the other is hate. <laughs> and I think it's very important because whenever I'm overwhelmed and I'm frustrated, I go to my hilarious box. <laughs> and then basically it's like, this is funny. Like, this is, this is cool. And I'm not saying hilarious in the terms of he said something stupid and I'm not laughing. It's definitely just a privilege of working with people with enough experience that each day, at the end of the day, I learn how to deal with an issue. You know, I am very well versed in some situations, and others I just completely suck at it. But the important thing is to just tell your colleagues, it's like, I don't know how to deal with this. Let me know. And sometimes, and this is a true story, our, our journalist actually taught me something. And I said, you know what, that's very smart. I've never thought of it. Thank you. You know, I don't think because you're PR and you're a journalist, you're like all of a sudden like, you know, like I'll crush you, you know? <laughs> I think it's um, in society, and that's, you know, I don't want to get into it, but I think we're all equals, whether you're a man or a woman, or we're, you know, tall, short, whatever, we're all equals. So, you know, you're teaching me something, I'm teaching somebody else, and it's, you know, so it's all about our learning process in society. So, no, I think it's just stay cool, and, be open to possible situations and just get ready. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, have you ever met someone within the industry, the gaming industry, that you have been very honored to meet because you used to be a gamer? And you still are, but is there anyone else that you have been like honored to meet? Like You mean like m me becoming a PR and then meeting someone that I truly admire? Yeah. Like I like Shigeru Miyamoto or Oh uh, well I had the chance of meeting Shigeru Miyamoto when I was a journalist, so that was already like amazing. <laughs> But to come to uh, Ubisoft and meet, you know, uh, Patrice Desilet, who is the creator of the Assassin's Creed franchise, to me that was like amazing. You know, uh, Max Delam, who uh, was working on Super Cell, totally. Um, I, uh, I I got many encounters for these for these folks, and yeah, I very respect. You know, uh, I think I, and it's going to be sound silly, but. My most freak out moment happened actually yesterday when Stan Lee came to play Marvel Avengers. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he's not even a video game developer. So I think if I have to rank, Stan Lee is. <laughs> <laughs> Stan Lee at the top. And he's like, and I, yeah. Yeah, right? <laughs> That's awesome. And the funniest part was when he was, he was playing, he was demoing the game, and at the end it's like, this is a very amazing game. <laughs> Would you like to send me a copy when it releases? And I was like, sir, take the death kit right now if you want. <laughs> so, yeah, but I was, I was very, I, I'm still encountering many people, and sometimes, you know, they don't have to be creative directors. You know, I met a guy who was an audio designer that no one had heard, and he did one of the soundtracks on, um, what's it, the uh, Deus Ex Human Revolution? 
at IDOS, and I was like, sir. <laughs> No, so, yeah. man over there. What are some ways for somebody to practice who wants to get into the gaming industry? Practice in what sense? In like developing games. Developing games? Well, we touched on earlier today in the panel. I mean, today, there are schools actually that teach you how to get into the industry, which 20 years ago, they didn't exist. So I think it's more about, you know, be good in school. Are you in elementary school still, or? Yeah. Okay, so just keep studying, get, keep rocking the school. <laughs> and then just, you know, expand, expand your horizons. You know, what do you like? You know, is it the audio, is it the visuals? You know, do you just want to do PR? Do you want to work on marketing? Like, what do you want to do? And I think at this point, we're lucky that there are schools that can offer you all those tools. So I would say follow your gut. Like, really, and just keep plowing. And you'll get there, I promise you, you'll get there. So there's a gentleman in the back in the red shirt, you had your hand up? Um, he just asked pretty much why I want to ask. Great. Okay. Uh, you know, continuing on the education theme, I was wondering what was your background in education and okay. how important is like your degree to getting, you said there are schools for getting into the gaming industry. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what if you don't want to do something that's specific to gaming? Okay, like, I'm going to be completely PR. honest. I, I didn't go to PR school. No, I didn't. Like, <laughs> you said you were a journalist. Did you have to take, did you? No, actually it started as an enthusiast. Okay. I never, so this is the thing. There's, I think there's a difference between a, a gaming enthusiast and a gaming journalist, you know? Um, a gaming journalist will actually do research and, you know, I mean, an enthusiast will actually do it, but there's this fine line between enthusiasts and journalists, you know. The enthusiast will cover it, you know, 24 7, he'll explore the area, he'll touch on subjects that other people won't. Other the gaming journalists, he'll probably just cover it, but stay more grounded, much more mainstream, and not going to, you know, uh, Majora's Mask and the level design, you know, he, he won't go there. So I think there's a difference between enthusiasts and journalism. But in both cases, you have to research, you have to know your product, you have to know who you're talking to, you have to know how you, you're going to handle yourself as well. Uh, as for my background, um, I had an unfinished uh, degree in phys ed. Uh, I have an unfinished degree in computer science. I have a, an unfinished uh, degree <laughs> And what was it? Communications. I did that just like three months and then I quit. Uh, but like I was saying earlier, I had a background in sports. So to me, my dream at 22 years old was playing the NBA, and I came this close. And knee injuries actually just pre prevented me from doing it. So for me, school was really not important. It is kind of on the tail that uh, you guys both work at Ubisoft, Montreal-based company. Is French a must for working in Ubisoft? Like we prefer that. Yeah. <laughs> the PR, like, do you do PR events in French? Yeah. yeah. I speak four languages. Really? So that helps sometimes when, you know. It, it is true because sometimes we get to E3, for example, and then uh, a guy from Spain will come to your booth and he starts speaking and says, like, hey, man, it's like Spanish. And no one understands. No one's like, I'm sorry, do you speak English? And the guy's like, ah, no, no, I've been in <laughs> and I'll just go up and it starts speaking Spanish. And then I was going to say, So, yeah, I mean, sometimes, you know. But like I said, my background, I'm, like I said, I'm very privileged on my position. I think from everything that I've done, I went to school, I studied so many things, and the gaming is, it was always been a compliment on what I did. And when the chance showed up to show up my skills and my knowledge, I did it and pushed it just as far as I could. And it drove me to a point where I wasn't even sure that I was going to make it. And up until the last day when I actually said, I'm done, then the opportunity showed up. And I realized, I was like, oh, so maybe after all, I wasn't doing it for the right, for the wrong reason. I was doing it, I was doing good, after all. So, so but, but keep going to school, don't quit school. There's <laughs> <laughs> a gentleman in the back room, an African right in front. Oh, yeah, you're, you're first. Can you speak louder? Sorry, so the door as soon as you close it, it'll be a little easier. Oh, okay. Um, you're aware that some companies have a, a better reputation than others in the industry as a whole, and it seems like some of the companies with the worst reputations don't take uh, criticism and actually act upon it. Like, um, for example, EA and Activision. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Without going into a lot of details, I can tell that we care, and every single company out there cares. Because in my personal opinion, and this is from my experience of covering games and studio layoffs and stuff, you know, these people have lives. You know, these people care. So if the company doesn't go well, then everybody goes to hell. So if you meet ever a video game CEO or is like, no, we don't care, there's like, there's tiny people, I'll crush them with my wallet. <laughs> and, yeah, then I can guarantee you that it's very, very, like I haven't met anyone actually saying that we don't care about what people think. I mean, to be completely honest, I mean, we as Ubisoft have a terrible problem with PC games. Like, terrible. But we keep going with PC games, we're trying to do our best, you know, I mean, we're, even if we're around for 25 years, you know, the company's still learning how to deal with that, you know? Um, on that topic, are you guys in PC games? Uh, I'm not going to you guys now, but um, are you guys listening, like, at all? <laughs> <laughs> I... I <have> fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, I play on consoles first. Um, <laughs> no, um, I can tell you that, you know, in terms of PC, it's, it's an ongoing issue for us. Like, it's an ongoing issue and we're aware of it. Um, I personally do not uh, know PC management and what they're doing. Uh, I work in Montreal and, you know, as you know, we have plenty of students across the world and management's in Paris. Uh, but I know that we care. Like, I can tell you, man, like, when there's a PC crash or something happens to you play, like, I see emails, like, my inbox is flooded. Like, everybody's trying to reach out and trying to find a solution. I can tell you, I can guarantee you that we work. If it's not me personally, I see my colleagues in Paris, like, what's going on? And they, so, I, I tell you, like, we care. I tell you, we do. Do you want me to front of Recently, I've been reading a lot. There's concerns about uh, how close reviewers are to the industry itself. And I wonder, as somebody that's been on both sides, how um, well, for me, when I was a journalist, it was, like, I didn't mind uh, talking with PRs, and, I mean, I became friends with them. Uh, but I think there's always this moral question, where it's like, I, I really like you, you're really my friend, and other thing, but um, I'm, I'm not willing to do this. For example, a company which I was like, hey, I sent you a game, or every copy of a certain game. They'll be like, oh, cool, that will give me enough time to play it and write about it. Awesome. It'll be constantly like two days later, just randomly chatting. It's like, hey man, if you give it like a 90, you will probably get it published before IGN. And I'm like, no, man, I'm good. <laughs> but you're still going to get your 90 if I truly I think it deserves it, right? Um, so that's how I used to treat it back then. And this is how basically I do not basically engage people into these type of things. Uh, however, I do understand the challenge of getting a copy the day or the day after it releases, and then these people actually basically count on it to do their coverage. So I'm very more understanding on that way. So I will give them the tools to work with, if they prove themselves, obviously. And yeah, so I will never ask that question. Personally, I always said no to those type of things, and I do expect that people would actually do the same. Like if I get an email and say, uh, I'm really liking this game and I'm going to give it a 93, can I publish it now? I, I would come to say no, uh, you know, send back the game and never email me again. Can I uh, take one over there? And, um, just how big was your website before you made the jump to Ubisoft? And, like how many Ubisoft games did you actually review before? Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell you what's the worst Ubisoft game that I reviewed. Yeah. yeah. You guys want to know? Yeah. It was Asphalt 3D on the 3DS. It was so bad that I actually burned the cartridge. <laughs> and if you go look at my review, it was definitely something like this type of abomination should never be ever done and reproduced ever again. In my review, you can still see it. Like Google it, it's there. I think I'd give it like a 2 out of 10 or something like that. And uh, the first thing that I did when I get to Ubisoft is I show the sales guys and so like, this is a review that I did on Ask Hockey. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, but my god, I've been reviewing games like very like seriously and stuff for the last six years prior to Ubisoft. And I can tell you that in the last two years when I was actually really going like crazy, 
I would actually review probably between five and ten games a week. Myself. And this is playing, finishing, and writing like around like probably a thousand, two thousand words each article. And that's on top of maybe ten news posts a day. I told you I was crazy. <laughs> so but in terms of numbers being focused, I, I, I couldn't tell right now. Like my memory is just that. Uh, but I can tell that I was one of those, and there's a lot of gaming sites in town that I work with now that I consider competition, but it was great that I was like, I'm not the only one trucking, you know? I'm not the only one. There's great ones, like Game Rant, Gaming Excellence, uh, Xbox Addicts, you know, like, uh, even the guys at Electric Playground, like, you know, TV broadcasts. There's a lot of people out there in Canada that do great content, and they're still doing it. And I'm actually glad and fortunate to basically, I remember when the email went out that I was at Ubisoft, all these guys were kind of my friends already content, right? I mean, we're competition, but we talk to each other, we know what we do and stuff. And they were like, oh wow, Ubisoft, yeah, somebody that understands us is over there now, awesome. And it's great to work with these guys now. You know, like we used to bond as friends, and now we you know, as, you know, can I say like business partners? I hate that word, but you know, that like we work together into something. I think we have a, we'll take one more question, and uh, then we, there's a reason why we brought these guys over here, so we will be giving them away, so. There, there's a reason why, though. There's a reason why, as I tell you. When I joined Ubisoft, I started working, you know, on unfinished projects, like Rocksmith and Assassin's Creed Revelation and Raymond Origins. And the first title that I actually started building on I mean, strategy, contacts, up until the launch of it and release was Ghost Recon Future Soldier, and for me, the game's awesome, by the way. <laughs> um, it's forever tied to me as my first real, you know, game release that I worked on passionately and where I learned everything that I learned from gaming journalism and how to execute and how to send a press release and how to engage people into the game and all that stuff that I took that knowledge and applied into the PR. And I'm very proud of this game, both as a retail, but it has this emotional tie and um, you know, I still have like the figurine and an unopened copy, like in my basement at home, and it'll forever stay there. You know, it's like this. Whenever I feel down, I look at that and like I help that. You know, I help doing that. So there's a reason why I brought it. It's very special to me. So I wanted to share that special moment with eight lucky people. <laughs> Well, we couldn't wait to release. We've been pre-signing this game for like two years before it actually gets a market. So we were happy to get that up. We'll take one more and then we'll uh, switch it over. So, let's go. Yeah. What's your favorite part about working in the gaming industry? Like, is it meeting people or traveling or? I hate you? traveling, dude. Like, <laughs> especially in, in this season when, like, right now I'm working on Supercell, Just Dance, uh, Assassin's Creed Three, Assassin's Creed Liberation, and Far Cry. Like, yeah. That's a lot. That's all for one guy. And uh, I can tell you that when I'm planning my calendar, like September to December, with preview events, launch events, business meetings, and all that stuff, yeah, I hate traveling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, for me, I'm always a social person. Like, you can talk to me, you'll see me on the street, you'll see me, you'll see me anywhere. If you stop talking to me, I will start talking to you. Like, you know, that's how I am, personally. And the reason why I'm in PR and that I think that I'm doing a good job is because, you know, I want to be with people, you know? It's us that make everything amazing. So I want to be part of that. So uh, Jay's going to be on the booth for the rest of the day, so if you have any other questions, feel free to stop by and be on the spot. Uh, what I thought we would do for the statues is now that you put him on the spot, I figured he could put you guys on the spot. So, I mean, Ubisoft has been around for, well, we've had a 25th anniversary last year, so we've had a good library of titles. I figure what we could do is maybe quiz you guys, some up maybe on some upcoming titles, maybe on some old stuff, whoever the first eight to get them right. Which ones are these guys? Okay, all right. <laughs> okay, all right, so for first question, let's see. Um, last week we announced the newest expansion for Ghost Recon Future Soldier. What's the name of that expansion? <laughs> yes! Arctic Strike. Mmm, close. <laughs> it, and you're a game journalist. <laughs> For shame, sir. <laughs> it was close. 
No one? Oh! Arctic Summit? Ah! Is it Arctic Storm? Ah! <laughs> <laughs> yes! What is it? Straight! <laughs> awesome. Good job, sir. You do it. Awesome. When is releasing? When is the DLC releasing? Ah, I got you that. You cannot win. <laughs> September 10th? Close. Three weeks? I, I need a, a, a week. There's a date. 28 is done. 12. Okay, I give it to the lady, 12, because it's oh, on, yes, yes, because it releases on the 11th on PSN and on the 12th on next bill. Uh, <laughs> so I guess for the lady. All right, let's go into some Assassin's Creed. Um, what's the name of the main character of Liberation? Oh, yes, sir. I don't remember. Never that. There. See, the first thing in video games is that you have to listen. <laughs> no one? It's the first letter. Oh, dude. John? <laughs> no, what's the, what's the name of the main character in Assassin's Creed Real Liberation? Bob. Oh, <laughs> Yes, it's a girl. What's her name? Stella. Tenny. Stella. Stella. This whole panel's trolling people. Google it, people. Ten expert Wi-Fi. All right, all right. I'll go with the easy one now. I'll go with it. I'll go with it. Uh, it, it, it's Avalon, by the way. Uh, uh, it's it's Avalon, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> okay, what's the name of the game site that I worked for before joining Ubisoft? Game Focus! Yeah! Awesome. He was listening to the panel. Good job to you, sir. Okay. Um, name me one of the games available in our booth right now. Yes. Just Dance. Yes. Three. Oh! oh. Name character of Far Cry 3. <laughs> what is Jonah coming up with? Just start naming all your dudes. It's a jack. 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 Brody. Oh, okay. Who said Brody? Okay. That's cool. It's boss, but I'll give it to Brody. <laughs> In Far Cry 3. Thank you. That's very good. Awesome. We have three more? We have three more. Okay. Uh, let's see. What game we have on the show for the Wii U? W. W. Come on. You, yeah, how much time it took? 15 minutes. Uh, record's 12 and it's mine. <laughs> Sorry. Um, what is... Oh, okay, that's, that's not a tricky one. I got one. We, we released Ray, a, Ray, a brand new Rayman. What's the name of that game? Rayman Legends. I said we released a latest. Rayman Origins? Rayman Origins. Origins, awesome. Listen. Okay, I got one for you. What's your Oh, I love that one. I, I'm an Assassin's Creed fan in here. i like Assassin's Creed fan. Okay. Well, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Okay. Sir in the green shirt, stand up. Okay, what's Connor's real name? Oh. <laughs> you said we're an Assassin's Creed fan. No, it's it's so it came out already. <laughs> Who else? I got it. Sir? Yes. Uh, Rahuna Gaydu. Oh, yeah, okay, that's close. That's close. You got it. Rahuna Gaydu. You got it. <laughs> it's good, because there's two different phonetics. His name is Raganodidon. Raganodidon. <laughs> well, that's Connor, yeah. Connor, Connor. <laughs> awesome. Well, you guys have been fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Speaking with people and being much more approachable in terms of public and being around more people and talking about something that I like uh, through coaching, I ended up liking it very much. Um, 
But gaming never really was something like I want to do a career out of it. You know, it was never in my plans. Um, that is when I started blogging, basically. So we're talking in 2005. You know, I started blogging, just posting online. Um, and then basically a friend of mine who had a website said, hey, you want to work, you want to write it for us and you know, get involved into a community. At the point, uh, there was no Xbox Live party chats or whatnot, so you know, basically the forums were the place to be. Um, so we started working in there, you know, Highland communities. And after a couple of years, I was decided to, I was like, okay, you know, this blogging thing might be interesting. Let's This is uh, from Gaming Enthusiast to Gaming PR, uh, starring J.S. Vedo. I'm not anybody important, but if anyone cares, my name is Adam. Uh, so the two of us actually work at Ubisoft together. Uh, Jason is our public relations manager. Uh, I'm one of his co-workers. I handle retail marketing, but that has nothing to do with why we're here today. We are here to really discuss Jay, uh, understand his transformation uh, from going to just a gaming enthusiast in a game like everybody in this room, and actually making it to working in one of the third party companies and experiencing the video game industry from the other side of the coin. So uh, we're gonna start off talking a little bit about Jay himself. We'll let you, I'll let him explain basically what he's doing now, what he did before, how he got to where he is today, and uh, then we'll open it up for some questions. Years ago, the blogging, as you know, has exploded with the internet and stuff. The game has become much more popular and then more people are have access, knowledge, they want to talk about game more and more and more and more. And at one point I just said, there's a lot of people out there, you know, and for me in order to make it out, I have to keep going and pushing. So it was more, the blogging became management, management became 24 hour basically job, you know, two phones, laptop, working night shifts, convenience stores and stuff like that with the coaching schools at the same time. So the passion really took over everything because I ended up quitting basketball, I ended up quitting coaching basketball and, and it became really, really not only a hobby but something that I wanted to do further. And working three years, basically, blogging constantly, all the time, managing teams. Afterwards, so uh, feel free to think of some good ones. So uh, let's kick it off, Jay. So, yeah, yeah, awesome. so but tell us a bit about yourself. Like, uh, how, what were you, where did you start off with? What did you start, um, did you start off with? Well, I was a gamer. I'm still a gamer, and I think I'll be a gamer forever, just like everybody else here. Uh, basically, my road was, I was gaming started just as a normal gamer, uh, and then I started branching out more into sports. So my ideal of gaming was always a hobby, it will always be a hobby. And basically, uh, when my basketball career didn't work out so well, I have started developing much more the coaching aspect and working with public, basically. Uh, it helped out in order to uh, help me forget uh, my failure as a basketball player and then finding out that it's just push a little bit more further. So now I was kind of handling a website um, named uh, Game Focus. So at the time it was just French based um, and then we branched out into English. And this guy was given the responsibility to create a community in English. There was many out there, you know, from Toronto, the West Coast and everything, but there was nothing that came out of uh, our small community in Quebec. So I, was, I started branching out, getting on some folks that were in different blogging spheres, different sites, and then we started having fun, you know, like reviewing games and talking about games, doing podcasts, uh, going to events and stuff, going to conventions as well. And then at one point, uh, a friend of mine said, hey, you know, have you ever thought of maybe working in the industry? And I was like, no, hell no, I'll never do that. You know, I'll just branch out into gaming, have a little blog and have my little fun. And then up until two years,